Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Goddard. I am the co-founder and CEO of Found Energy. Uh, if you remember one of the talks from this morning, Ben showed this nice plot of reliability versus flexibility. And right at the top right corner was electricity. And I'll broaden that to energy. And the reason that it's in that corner is that we have a massive logistical program running behind the scenes to get energy to all places on Earth where it's needed. And to do that, we move 65 terawatt hours of energy just as oil and gas every single day and just by boat. Uh, it's a massive amount of infrastructure to, to make it that reliable and that flexible. And when we think about moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy, we'll need to do that too. But renewable energy comes with its challenges. It's often not co-located where you would want to use it, especially in an industrial context. There's a lot of things that are just difficult to uh, electrify, like uh, industrial heat, for example, uh, or some transportation applications. And so we'll need bridge fuels or low carbon fuels uh, to use in the same way that we do with fossil fuels. And so at Found Energy, we've figured out how to do this with, uh, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, it's not AI, it's AL, uh, aluminum. Uh, we take aluminum and we turn it into the world's first rechargeable fuel. So what we do is we take aluminum, which is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. It's actually more energy dense than fossil fuels. Uh, it's very easy to transport uh, and can be actually cost competitive with fossil fuels. We take this aluminum, we extract the energy from that via just a simple oxidation reaction using water as the oxidizer. We get that energy out as heat and hydrogen gas. And then that final aluminum oxide byproduct can actually just go back to where you made the aluminum in the first place and you can recharge it using existing smelting infrastructure. Now, the, the key challenge to actually enabling aluminum to be a fuel is that there's an oxide layer that forms on the outside, which is very e passivating and prevents this reaction from happening. So during my PhD at MIT, I discovered a, a process for disrupting that oxide layer to enable it to react with water. This uh, video here shows, it's not sped up at, at all, it's in real time showing a, a large piece of aluminum that's disintegrating uh, when it's exposed to water via this process we call fractal exfoliation. Uh, it's super cool. Those, hydro those little bubbles you see there are, are hydrogen bubbles. We're using this technology to decarbonize a wide array of industries from industrial heating to long haul trucking uh, to maritime shipping. These are massive industries and have a significant impact uh, on driving climate change. Our beachhead market is actually in the aluminum oxide industry. Uh, when we react aluminum and water, we produce this material called alumina trihydrate uh, before it goes to aluminum oxide. And that's actually a, the precursor chemical used to produce all aluminum oxide today. Aluminum oxide is going to be a $70 billion industry by 2030 and currently needs a lot of thermal energy to uh, be produced. And, and that's a, a large driver uh, of uh, industrial uh, carbon emissions in this sector. And with our technology, they can actually use low-grade aluminum waste that otherwise couldn't be recycled and simultaneously use that as the energy source to run these thermal processes, but also to supply a significant amount of this precursor chemical, ATH, alumina trihydrate. Uh, and this means they can save the amount of bauxite they have to mine by a significant factor. It saves the uh, carbon emissions um, associated with that aluminum oxide. And importantly, it saves the amount of the tailings from the... the bauxite mining called red mud, which they've had a lot of problems with here in Europe. With our technology, we're not only decarbonizing uh, this beachhead market, uh, but we're also actually potentially saving them quite a bit of money. We can guarantee that they can produce uh, thermal energy at the cost that they're currently paying today for uh, natural gas-based thermal energy. Uh, and the lower we go on, on the, the uh, the ladder of aluminum waste quality, uh, we can actually offer uh, a significant green discount uh, on that energy usage. So today we are looking for pilot partners, specifically in the EU uh, and France would be amazing. Um, we're looking for manufacturing partners to help scale up our technology. The centerpiece of our technology scale up are what we call aluminum water reactors. They're big machines that facilitate this reaction to produce all of this steam and, and hydrogen gas. 
Uh, and if, based on what I've told you today, you think you have other ideas for, for new markets where you need uh, a very practical, energy-dense, low-cost, low-carbon fuel, hit me up. I would love to talk about it. Um, we do things from industrial heating to hydrogen transportation and storage to long-duration energy storage and uh, waste management. So thank you so much. Looking forward to chatting later. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, we continue with the uh, Wizzy Vision. Hi, everybody. I'm Laurent, the founder and CEO of uh, Wizzy Vision. So a few facts. 8% uh, of people in the uh, US and France are illiterate, meaning they cannot uh, read and write uh, uh, fluently. If you add the people who cannot understand compl one complex sentence, it's 20% of the population. None of uh, these people are here today. They're all working on the front line in the construction industry, in retail, in transportation. And, uh, and these people uh, don't have the right tools today uh, to work. So what do they do? They have no tools to share images because IT systems have been built in, our com in uh, all our companies with uh, text and, uh, and content. And so today they use WhatsApp or Messenger to share images, uh, uh, bring this to their, to their bosses. And the problem is that WhatsApp is not secure. Uh, and uh, all the data, data, metadata are lost. Maybe you don't know, but the in any image shared on a social network loses his uh, geolocation, who has taken the picture, uh, when it has been taken. Okay, so uh, the, the, the first fact, se second fact um, uh, is, and I'm, I need, you know, the, the product they, they showed this morning, you know, where they can remind you what to do when you, fo when you forgot what to say. Uh, uh, second fact is IT is far away from... Uh, from the from the the front line, I know many IT people who have never set a foot on the front line. So uh, enterprises are missing agility. Front line managers they want to develop solutions which are available, you know, in uh, in hours, in days, uh, to solve their 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 problems and collect information. So uh, uh, knowing this, uh, we have built with a vision. So Wizzy Vision is first a, uh, a, 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 what you call a super app, so an application available on, on uh, iOS and, uh, and Android, uh, uh, where we can push uh, 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 one app per job inside this application, build and deploy it in less than one hour, without any writing of code. That's very important. I'm a CPA by training. I don't know how to write one line of code, but I can come and deploy a, a business application to collect information on the, on the front line. So instant collection of front line data with image and voice, without the need to type text. So you see a small animation here where uh, we have what you call a WYSIVision flow, which is a step-by-step -step, uh, um, uh, process uh, wi which you can deploy again in no code with vision scanners and speech to text, where the idea is that the frontline worker can collect information based just on image, image and voice. No need to type in text. I guess that's the first, uh, that's, uh, the, the, the first part of a solution. But it's not only a mobile app. So you see uh, the app builder on the left, which enables you to instantly uh, deploy uh, a no-code app uh, and to do, to do what most of the use cases of the customer today are on proof of work, uh, risk, anomalies reporting, visual inventories, visual inspection, things which are either not done today because people have no time to do it or badly done or, or with application not used. Okay? But also in the office, it gives the visibility to the enterprise, the eyes of the enterprise to the front line. Because very often the customer complain, the operation, the managers complain that they don't see what's happening on the front line. Okay, so, and you may also uh, know that everybody speaks about big data, but nobody speaks about big data with images. Okay, very often when you want to run a, a machine learning model, because we do also some stuff like this, for our customers the biggest problem is to find images. Images are hidden behind process inside application, there is no, no big data for images. One small example, we had a, a customer uh, selling heating equipment. We, we asked them, you know, can you give us data? Just We just run a model, so it recognizes automatically which heating equipment is installed. Uh, but the, the answer was they gave us marketing images. Okay, so, so we, we need, we provide this digital asset center, which is a big data uh, for images, giving the eyes on the operation to the, to the customer. Uh, of course, all this is opened by APIs to connect to the enterprise application uh, if you wish, when you wish. Uh, our main customers are a bit, not all over the world, but we have customers in Asia Pacific already, in LATAM, and in, in Europe. In, uh, in the construction industry, we work with, uh, with Altrad with a nice use case. They rent a scaffolding, 
Okay, and the main game of people who are renting scaffolding is to say, I haven't received this piece of scaffolding, so I don't, I don't, I'm not giving it back to you. In fact, I'm stealing it. Okay? You know this in the, in the construction industry. This is a big, big topic, this type of uh, sort of stealing, stealing material. Uh, but now they just send a picture. Now look at, the, look at the truck delivered yesterday, timestamp, it was here. You had nine packets, and out eight packets. Again, that was the example I've shown you, which is basically a return the, when taking picture when you return, and uh, the other example is, uh, and I'm closing on this, is uh, Geopost, which is the equivalent of FedEx or DHL in, uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they have a lot of, uh, like any of these companies, of uh, damaged parcels or lost and found parcels. You don't know where it comes, where it goes. Uh, they have divided by four the time needed to make the inventory of the content of these boxes. And we have a database of multiple million, Im million images searchable across Europe multilingual. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Uh, we will continue with the primitives. Hi, my name is Virg Khan, and I'm the CEO of Primitives Biodesign. At Primitives, we're producing biomaterials made from sea urchins, and we're a Silicon Valley-based company. I'm also an alumni of the MIT Media Lab where I did my graduate research on stimuli responsive biomaterials for industrial design applications. As I mentioned, we're making biominerals and engineered materials from sea urchins in order to address two key environmental problems, kelp conservation and waste reduction. Because of climate change, the oceans are warming. This has led to the emergence of the wasting disease, which has killed off the major predators of sea urchins. As a result, sea urchins have been destroying kelp forests all over the world, including the coast of California and European coasts from Spain to France and Norway. I'm a scientific scuba diver and I collect data underwater. If you were to come scuba diving with me in a vibrant, healthy kelp forest, this is what you'd see. An abundance of fish, invertebrate, and macroalgae of all kind. But unfortunately, more commonly what we're seeing today are these sea urchin barrens. That's because kelp are the forests of the sea. So with the forests gone, the fish and wildlife are also gone. Kelp also play a central role in mitigating climate change by sequestering carbon from the atmosphere, converting CO2 to biomass. We've been working with partners across sectors, including global environmental nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and regional communities of urchin divers to remove these destructive urchins so we can restore kelp forests. This is viable because kelp is actually one of the fastest growing crops in the world. So by removing the urchins, this allows for the rapid reforestation of the kelp and marine biodiversity. But beyond restoring kelp forests, we're also reducing commercial waste. Sea urchin waste is an abundant, untapped feedstock in the seafood industry. We leverage sea urchins as a biofactory to grow minerals, pigments, and compounds, minerals like calcium carbonate, to be used as additives for paint, plastics, and the building material industry. This also requires less energy than traditional mining operations. At Primitives, we have expertise in materials engineering, green chemistry, digital fabrication, industrial design, and biology. That means we can produce custom formulated materials and products. This is an example of a suite of materials that we produce using a zero waste approach taking the waste product of one material for use as an input to another, resulting in four distinct products. We've isolated and stabilized a unique class of pigments called spinochromes, giving us three different colors. We produce 3D printing filaments that are printable using standard 1.75 millimeter nozzles. Our additives can be incorporated into flexible film plastics to enhance the processability, mechanical, and moisture barrier properties of these materials. Our engineered stone composites have comparable tensile properties as natural marble, and they're fluorescent under UV light. If you're a potential partner that's interested in this vast array of pigments, compounds, and minerals that sea urchins have to offer, I'd like to invite you to collaborate with us and explore how our engineered materials and additives can enhance your product's performance and environmental impact. By working with us, you're working close to the source, not just to procure a new material or replace an ingredient, but to take part in sequestering carbon, enhancing biodiversity, and reducing waste. 
I hope you'll join me on our journey to reshape the material landscape of our modern economy, to build a future that we ultimately actually want to live in together. Thank you. Thank you. Now, craft that AI. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I work in Craft AI, uh, a machine learning operation company. So, uh, yeah, it is no secret that uh, the AI wave is ongoing. Um, well, ChatGPT is about to compete with human reasoning. Uh, analysts say most of the job will be impacted. Um, the AI wave is ongoing. Nevertheless, according to Gartner, it takes a staggering 7.3 months to put a project into production, and 85% of projects fail. Why is that? Many reasons. But it is mainly due to the gap between IT, business, and data teams, data teams that do the machine learning projects. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have a solution uh, at Craft AI, which is a machine learning operation. So machine learning operations is a way to address this, uh, this challenge by providing a framework for this team to collaborate. Uh, with Craft AI, um, we can uh, machine learning operation platform um, data teams, executive, IT teams can collaborate seamlessly. What happens normally? So normally, picture this. A data team diligently crafts an uh, AI model only to face the challenge to implement it in the current IT ecosystem. And once the project goes live, business team may find it needs some adjustments, initiating a revision loop. Alternatively, you can have data teams that work with business team on a model that is great, but unimplementable within the current IT framework. With Craft AI, machine learning operation platform, data teams can experiment and test a project, deploy it uh, into production, and continuously monitor it with the business team so uh, they can make sure it uh, reach long-term business goals. So Craft AI, so the slide is a bit uh, disformed, but with Craft AI, it's a machine learning operation platform for uh, data, IT, and business team. On this platform, you can address most of the use cases, use cases that needs to be addressed with, uh, by data teams. We also have an offer uh, for a large language model. So large language model is a chat GPT uh, models. Uh, there is also um, a part of the platform that is now dedicated for data scientists to develop these large language models in, a in a collaboration with business and IT teams. Uh, so Craft AI uh, supports three things. Experimentation by the data science teams. So all the, all the uh, different steps of uh, that data science team perform during creating a model. Deployment, deployment into the current IT uh, ecosystems uh, and uh, monitoring uh, into production. So when the models are live, uh, Craft AI allows to, in the same platform, to see if they perform well or not. And if at some point they drift, meaning that they uh, don't perform as well as before because the data has changed, because the platform is unified, it is possible to seamlessly uh, go back to re-experimentation, retraining, and redeployment, uh, lowering uh, time to market, and lowering this uh, cost. So yeah, so Craft AI aims to uh, unify the uh, tools that uh, are normally used for a machine learning project into uh, one, uh, one platform. And uh, the result, it is a dramatic boost in productivity of AI teams. This uh, lowering time to market, this lowering cost, and also it can help their time, their, these teams, these AI teams, to refocus their creativity into addressing the other projects, the untapped potential of digital transformation through AI. 
So yeah, this is uh, more or less the platform. So you have many tools that allow to uh, monitor the model into uh, production. Uh, we integrate with the whole ecosystem, so we are uh, open, we use open source technologies, so it is in our DNA. And uh, we have an academy that uh, allow to train teams in the, using the MLOps methodology that allows to, on top of the platform, to have, um, to have a, a culture of machine learning operations. So last, uh, last our differentiator, end-to-end -end platform, we are European platform, and uh, we uh, help to better understand models. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. So we will uh, finish with uh, near brain. Hi everyone, I'm Clément de Laval and I'm the head of sales of near brain. Happy to discuss with you today. Okay, I will start with one figure coming from a PwC study earlier this year. 40%, 40% of Fortune 500 firm CIOs are worried about the future, basically. They think their company will not be viable uh, in the future. There was another figure in this study. If we look back to this Fortune 500 uh, ranking, half of the company are not no longer part of it. So the question is, why some companies are able to transform and how they can shape a resilient organization. Most of the analy analysis uh, coming from, for example, George Berzin are saying that this is a company that transition to a skills-driven organization that are able to, to make it basically. So there is a, an answer coming from HR. So the mission of NeoBrain, and this is why we started five years ago, is about putting the right skills in the right place at the right time. So how do we do that? We provide a talent management platform using AI to detect from any content what is the skills. We normalize it and we support many processes. So here are five steps, for example, but we will rely obviously on the data of the companies we are working with, consolidating data from the HRE system, detecting the skills that are necessary for these companies that are managing by uh, uh, your employees, basically. And we will fuel some HR processes, such as mobility, so we will provide opportunities to your employees in alignment with your business need. We will also fuel your upskilling strategy. So uh, how can we, for example, provide individual development plan? And we correlate all this data, all this analysis with the performance, so how we can fuel for example, annual interview, succession plan, people review. And when we analyze all this data, this is where we can basically predict what can happen in the future. So we plan how we will evolve your workforce in the future. Beyond this world, I just want to deep dive through a little demo. If it works, that was the challenge. Yeah, so here is our platform. Simple user journey, Josephine Baker is an employee of your company, guys, and we will consolidate our experiences profile from your HRE system or through a LinkedIn synchronization, basically. But we will translate this experience profile thanks to our AI into a skills profile. So the stars you can see on the screens are the level of mastery that will be assessed through the platform, and we also identify the motivation of an employee to mobilize the specific skills. Then you have some analysis, skills gap, basically, uh, skill, uh, that need to be fulfilled. And this matrix is important because it correlates the motivation of your employees, the level of mastery uh, regarding all our, all our skills. So in green, every single right. So it's a little bit quicker than expected, but if in green, every single right, uh, I'm an expert, I'm motivated, uh, and uh, uh, basically, we will capitalize on these skills to uh, provide an uh, internal uh, career plan. Not sure it works very well. Okay, it's co it will come back. Um, so I was telling you in blue, if you remember the matrix on the top of the screen, you can r retrieve uh, the skills that I need to develop as an employee. Uh, so once we do that, coming from these skills, uh, 
portfolio, the skills profile, we are able to basically suggest internal career paths. So this was the two analyses that I wanted to highlight through the video, trying to clear the time. So this, and basically in the, in the bottom of the screen, red and uh, orange will don't take too much into account that type of skills because the, colla the collaborator is not motivated. So here are the career paths. So we will suggest, for example, to Josephine coming from an HR background, how she can move to a marketing position. So in s terms of skills, what does it mean? What are the gaps to fill again? Um, and then once we do that, we are able to connect to the learning management system, identify the training catalog in the training catalog, which are the contents that I need to follow, which are the mentor I need to discuss with, how I can fulfill basically a gap. And also in terms of open position, what are the jobs today open through my company that match with my profile. So this is about employee features, but from a manager perspective, you have other features. This one is just about how I can identify people that match with a specific project, specific vacancies that I need to fill, or I'm just looking for an expert managing a skills. And just to conclude, here is uh, about Neobro, and we've been accelerating the two last years, uh, buying two companies, Wiser Skills and Flat Rent, and we opened in the US and in Germany. So we are 140 serving 120 customers. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's now time to um, time answering uh, questions. So I invite uh, the four other startups to come with us. So maybe can we see the question, please? No. Can we see the question, please? Otherwise, I will take my phone. Oh, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe for uh, with division with uh, three words, you want to begin? Yeah. So the third question, no, not yet. Not yet working with Brig, but I hope so soon. Uh, first question: How do we discover uh, uh, this? It's a mix of uh, vision. One of my founding partners is Louis Noges, a well-known visionary uh, uh, in the French IT, let's say. Uh, and the second, so we know uh, mobility was uh, was here. Uh, everybody had a mobile, everybody uh, knew how to take picture, everybody was exchanging, uh, uh, despite the topic of, uh, of uh, uh, literacy. And second was uh, talking to a lot of people, including my nephew, who is a, a frontline worker, a factory worker. He knows well how to speak, etc. but he's taking picture and he's sharing his picture with Maj on WhatsApp when he changes shifts. So, so including, you know, so connection really to the ground. Good knowledge of IT and the way that IT is too far away from the from never go on the, on the ground. So we had this knowledge working with IT, and then understanding of what's happening. And then it's no no magic. Huh? Four years of discussing, building different sets of tools to arrive here. So it's a long was a long way, but now we are there. Thank you. Maybe uh, next question for uh, Prometheus. Yeah, it's a surprise. Hi. Um, so the question is collection costs and availability of the materials. Just a little context, so it's these, this issue is happening all over the world, and one acre, within one acre, you have 3,500 pounds of urgent. And so just within one site in California, there's over 400 miles of sea urgents that needs to be removed, and this is just a small site in one state in California. So the availability is massive, um, and then in terms of the cost, it really depends, right? What particle size are you looking for? What's the purity? What's the application? What's the morphology? All those are gonna have slightly different processing costs. So a lot of it is really a question of your target applications, what are the functionalities that you are looking for? Thank you. Next one maybe for QFTI. Uh, yes, so it is how, you, how do you determine KPIs to build successful AI applications? So, I would say it depends on the AI application because the goal of AI application is to be useful, uh, useful for the business. Of course, you have technical KPIs, like uh, going fast, lower time to market, it doesn't fail. But at the end of the day, the goal is for the AI application to be useful. And um, so it depends on the use case. For example, for advertising technology, it is 
does the user click on the ad that is uh, recommended by AI? Or, it is on, or if it is on, I see the second question, use case for construction companies uh, like uh, resource allocation or uh, predictive maintenance, we're working for, we are client for with predictive maintenance. It is like, like if um, predict the AI algorithm predicts that in some uh, construction there may be a failure, when the technician goes into this, uh, this uh, building, uh, predicting the failure with like low signal, um, low signal uh, captured by uh, some uh, sensors in the building. Uh, when the technician goes there, there is actually a problem. And if there is no problem, the AI has failed. So this can be the KPI. And uh, it is, so it is important to have a monitoring, uh, constant monitoring in order to make sure that this KPI, once they are defined, uh, are still, um, are still uh, valid. Because maybe, uh, for example, in the construction industry, if uh, uh, some, um, the captors has changed or maybe some usage data has changed, maybe the model will not be as um, strong as before. Uh, then you, you need to monitor that to see if the model become uh, less strong and then uh, to uh, go and to, to update the model. So I would say it's most of it's the business and the data team that together, uh, together define the KPIs that are de change depending on the use case. Thank you. I see a question for you uh, from the energy. Which one? Uh, ah, so startup maturity. So um, I had been developing this technology for about six years before starting Found. Uh, first at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, they discontinued that project and let me take that IP with me to MIT. I then spent about four years doing a PhD there. And then we got the unit economics to the point where it made sense to commercialize, and that was about a year and a half ago. Um, and in that, in the past year-ish, uh, we've scaled our technology about 100x, and we have one more scale-up to go before we hit our industrial minimum viable product, which will be a, a one megawatt reactor that we already have uh, considerable interest for. Thank you. Uh, Narbon, your, your brain, excuse me, you have two, two questions. Thank you. So are the jobs profiles created? Um, so this first question. So usually we rely on a, a job repository coming from our customer, but uh, thanks to our AI and the analysis we run, especially on job boards, we are able to provide job description to our customer if they are not consolidated. So first part of the answers. And in terms of skills, we also have our own ontology, uh, and we work then on semantic. Uh, how do you want to describe skills? At which level of granularity you want to work, to highlight some expertise, for example. So we provide in mindful uh, insight on this. And the second question, uh, I did not completely understand who fills the questionnaires and who can see the results in terms of competencies. So coming back to the screen, I, I tried to highlight with the stars and the, the little heart. Uh, it depends basically on the, on the expectation of our customers. Some of them, they want only uh, to fuel annual interview, for example, that are happening in another system. So it's just about uh, self-assessment. And some others, they want a reassessment from the manager. So it's up to you, basically. Thank you. Three questions left. Maybe one for our primitives. Oh, I already addressed that one. Oh, excuse me. Uh, from the energy. Sure. Uh, so if you take a liter of aluminum, which is you know about this big, uh, that will actually contain double the amount of energy that would be contained in, the, in a liter of gasoline. Um, it's uh, about 10 times more energy dense than liquid hydrogen. It's about five times more energy dense than, than methanol and, and ammonia. So that's one of the real advantages of aluminum as a fuel. And uh, we will finish with uh, craft AI. Yeah, so I already talked about uh, some use cases like uh, resource allocation. I can say also, for example, like quality uh, inspection. And uh, but I can go also a little bit deep dive on um, on uh, predictive maintenance of what we are doing with one of our clients. It's uh, so they are putting some sensors. They already have sensor in their building that are co this collecting data, various kind of data. So with this, uh, uh, there is an algorithm that is on the Craft AI platform that can predict. Uh, if um, if a building uh, has a high probability of having some failure, so they can uh, go uh, on it and uh, see uh, if there is uh, any problem. So this allows them to uh, uh, do maintenance um, like before a problem actually happens. And uh, the model is deployed inside the building with some um, 
some uh, special uh, special uh, captor where you have uh, models also that are uh, that are working on um, capturing on um, that are working with the data that is uh, being captured and uh, these models uh, are inside the building so they can ha put the metric uh, they can measure in real time uh, what is um, uh, if there is a failure or not and for this we partner with uh, sp specialized uh, companies that can do edge uh, edge deployments so models that are uh, in on site uh, and that are that can be then uh, updated into the platform and then reput on site if uh, there is uh, we see that there is a drift or a low uh, uh, or the quality lowers Thank you. I see a new uh, question. Who wants to, to answer? <laughs> uh, the question is that there's a lack of gender diversity very apparent in this panel, <laughs> in this group. Um, I think this is a common experience, not just in technology development, but in general in the entrepreneurship ro world, and I think also in venture capital as well, right? Um, and leadership roles, largely. How, what can we do? I think that there's, there's, I think there's a few challenges, a few issues. Some of it is in, there's a different kind of culture with the way in which certain workplaces have established, and it makes it difficult for different types of people, whether it's women or different ethnic backgrounds or different cultural backgrounds to enter. And there's like norms around communication, norms around particular knowledge that people should have and expectations surrounding that. So I think that that's one of the things that are just having people that are in positions of power and leadership to be aware of their own cultural biases and to be aware of these things that may be offloaded to other people might be a cultural issue that's within the organization. Um, Largely, like, how do you address these issues? It's a cultural problem in any kind of space, whether it's in a business or a, a society, right? So with any larger cultural issue, you need large-scale awareness and, and cultivation of a slightly different reality and a different future. And I think everyone in some ways needs to be part of that process. So anyways, that's my, my, my take on <laughs> this question. Thank you. So thank you for the pitch, uh, the question, and now I leave the floor to Olivier to conclude with Christophe. Thank you. Thank you, uh, all of you, today, uh, because it was a great morning, but also a great afternoon with all the startups and. Uh, we, we love uh, in, in within week to, to let's say to to have two pillars. First is explore, and we saw this afternoon that explore is there. Uh, the third one is cross, and uh, I hope that during the networking uh, lunch, but after also during the networking session, the cross will be also there. And we like also the change and how to be able to change our life, but also our companies. And I'm sure that within MIT uh, family and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Cap Digital also uh, uh, environment, we can uh, uh, easily change and accelerate the way we are changing the world. Yeah, that, uh, that's a great point, uh, Christophe. And we, we saw, um, as I mentioned this morning, a lot of important pieces of our ecosystem. So you saw you know, very strong academics, you saw very strong and inspiring startups. Um, there's of course the role of uh, government in all this, the, the role of risk capital as well that needs to be talked about, and the role of corporate organizations like Bouygues, and I really want to thank you, Christophe, for all the support. Uh, Always a pleasure. Yeah, it, it's, no, but it's great, and, and receiving you on campus in September is also very inspiring for us, because you're tr you trigger with your questions, with, with your comments, your trigger uh, thoughts in our faculty and researchers as well. And that, that's critical. That's how we progress. So I hope you saw today that ecosystem in action because this is really what we wanted to, uh, to show you with all those five pieces I just uh, talked about.
Thank you, uh, uh, Olivier. Thank you all. And now it's uh, the time of the networking session. And uh, it's you next year. See you next year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.